My opening text is from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, and I will read from verses 1 to 3. Ezekiel, chapter 37, from verses 1 to 3. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know what an answer to a question. Ezekiel was a prophet of God. He was both a prophet and a priest. And he was from the tribe. Uh, he, he and his people were taken when the Babylonians conquered Judah and took them into captivity. So Ezekiel was taken into captivity from Judah into Babylon, just like Daniel was also taken into captivity. And whilst he was in captivity, at this very low moment in his life, God began to use him. And in his 30th year, when he reached the age of 30, God started to reveal things to him. So Ezekiel's prophetic words started in his 30th year. By this time, he's been in Babylon for a while. And in a moment of discouragement, a moment of apparent defeat, God raised him up. It's amazing how God sometimes raises people up at supposedly wrong times. At the time when everything is supposed to be bad, that is when he decides to do something exceptional and extraordinary in your life. Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel is a very deeply prophetic book. And if you've paid attention to uh, the book of Ezekiel, sometimes you read it and wonder whether you should continue reading or just jump to something else. Because there are so many experiences there, some of them deeply symbolic, and they are not always easy to understand. Just to give you uh, a, a sort of a background to the book, the phrase, thus says the Lord, occurs about 130. 30 times in the book of Ezekiel alone. So the man is constantly declaring the word of the Lord. The phrase, the word of the Lord came to me, occurs over 50 times in the book of Ezekiel. The phrase, that you may know that I am the Lord, occurs 60 times in the book of Ezekiel. So it just shows you the intensity of the prophetic ministry of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's prophetic ministry was very unique because he was what you call a demonstrative prophet. A demonstrative prophet. That means that most of his prophecies, God will uh, include him in the message. And so sometimes God will use his own story to be the prophecy or he'll be an active participant in the prophetic word that God is giving. So he's a very involved prophet. He's a very demonstrative prophet. And the vision that he saw is an indication of Ezekiel's demonstrative uh, prophecy where God takes him to a valley and shows him something. So he, he literally is infused in the situation. He's not outside of the situation. He's inside the situation. And so God takes Ezekiel in chapter 37 to a valley of dry bones. And most of you are familiar with that story. 
But for you to understand Ezekiel chapter 37, you have to go back to Ezekiel chapter 36. Because in Ezekiel chapter 36, God said some things to Ezekiel. And the things he said were so fantastic and so big in the midst of a contradictory environment that God had to take him to chapter 37 to affirm the prophecy of chapter 36. So I'm going to take you briefly to Ezekiel chapter 36 and then I'll bring you back to chapter 37. In Ezekiel 36, now if you read the book of Ezekiel, it starts with very, very difficult prophecies. And now we are in chapter 36 from verse 9 and 11. Ezekiel 36, 9 and 11. It says, for indeed I am for you. This is God speaking to Israel. He says, I am for you. And I will turn to you and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it. And all the cities shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you mind and beast, and you shall increase and bear young, and I'll make you inhabited as in former times, and do better for you than at your beginnings, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Then in verse 24, he continues, this is God speaking through Ezekiel, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all your countries, and bring you into your own land, then I'll sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my ways, and you shall keep my commandments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people. I shall be your God. Now, remember, Ezekiel is giving this prophecy when he is a captive in Babylon. So, he himself is in captivity. And he's among a group of slaves in Babylon. And from the place of a slave in Babylon, God gave him this prophecy about Judah and Jerusalem that it will be rebuilt it will be great. The nations will come to it. And so, if you look at where Ezekiel is, in Babylon, in captivity among slaves, and the prophecy coming out of his mouth, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Because a prophecy is contradicting his situation. It is as if God appears to us and God uses somebody to give us a prophecy about Africa. And God makes a fantastic prophecy and a promise to us that he'll make Africa the leading economic continent of the world in 30 years. In this Africa, in this Ghana, God comes and says, in the next 30 years, this is going to be the leading continent economically. And we are not saying it from America. We are saying it from Africa. So that's where Ezekiel is. He's in Babylon. And he's prophesying prosperity for Judah when he's a slave. And the people heard him. The people who heard him were also slaves like him. They may think, Ezekiel, something is wrong with your thinking. Or if Ghana, should, God should give us a word that Ghana will surpass the United Kingdom in GDP in 20 years. In Akufuado's Ghana. Now if you heard such a prophecy, you will question the prophet. I'm just bringing it to reality to see the impossibility of Ezekiel's prophecy. Or maybe somebody is walking through the streets of Ghana, Accra. He sees a mad woman who has given birth to a boy who is eating 
in the dustbin and says, that says the Lord, you'll be the leader of your nation and through you the nation shall prosper. If you heard such a word, you wonder, what is going on? So that is what happened to Ezekiel. From chapter 1, his prophecies are all condemnatory. Then he gets to chapter 36 and everything changes. God says, I'm going to bless you. Judah will be populated. I will restore you. You shall build the land and all of that. And he's actually saying that Israel will be the leader of the world to a people who are slaves. So I'm sure Ezekiel himself is thinking of the prophecy and asking, did I say it or did I not say it? Am I, am I crazy or what? So after chapter 36, God says, okay, Ezekiel, I'm going to show you a second vision to confirm what I just told you in chapter 36. And that is why he goes to the valley of the dry bones. Are you, are you getting it? Because God is now about to paint a clear picture to Ezekiel concerning what he just told him about the impossible future he has spoken about concerning Jerusalem and Israel. I believe that we can position ourselves with the prophet Ezekiel tonight and we can also stand to say God has said some things in chapter 36 of our lives. And when we heard it, it was too good to be true. But now God is bringing you to the chapter 37 of your life. To let you know that what he said to you in chapter 36 will come to pass. Somebody say I'm in chapter 37. And chapter 36 will happen. All right, so now we go to chapter 37 and hear the prophecy or see the enactment of this prophecy in the life of Ezekiel. So I go back to verse 1, chapter 37. Chapter 37 and the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man. In Ghana, he said, Unipaba, son of man. Can these bones live? And son of man looked at the bones and says, sir, only you can tell. Because what Ezekiel is saying, as far as I'm concerned, these bones have no way of living. But if they're going to live, it's up to you. But if it was up to me, these bones can never live. But if it is up to you, maybe it will live. So that's what Ezekiel is saying. So when he says that, God says, okay, I can work with that. I can work with that. So... The passage says that he saw the bones in a valley. And a valley normally talks about low place. But, you know, in those days, they, they went to fight in valleys. Nations went to war. They rarely fight on mountains. You can't fight on mountains. So they would descend to a valley and fight. Remember David and Goliath? They went to a valley and fight. Uh, the valley of Armageddon. That's where the final battle is going to be fought. It's a valley. So they fought in valleys. So this is a battleground. The valley is a battleground where an army has gone to war and has been defeated. Now the Bible doesn't tell us which army it is, but I presume that it is a picture of Israel who went to war against the Babylonians and Assyrians and were totally vanquished. Because later, God will tell us what the vision is all about. So, this valley is full of bones. It's a valley and it's full of bones. And Ezekiel said that the hand of the Lord 
came upon him. The hand of the Lord speaks of the power of God. And then he says, the hand of the Lord brought me in the spirit of the Lord. Two things are happening. The hand of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord. May the hand of the Lord be upon you. May the spirit of the Lord rest upon you. May the hand of the Lord bring you into the spirit of the Lord. So the hand of the Lord is upon him. The spirit of the Lord is upon him. And, and he's transported from where he is into this place where the vision is taking place. So if you were with Ezekiel, probably you were a slave and you were with Ezekiel. And you were in slave quarters or around the, uh, the river Cheba or wherever you were. Ezekiel will seem to be there. But at another level, he's not there. Because the hand of the Lord has come upon him and taken him on a spiritual journey outside of his physical location. The Lord brings him to this valley and begins to show him what he meant by what he said in chapter 36. And in this vision, we see three kinds of gatherings that I will talk about. Because this vision is a vision of process. Everybody say process. A process is a step that leads to progress. It's not happening instantly. It's a process. Somebody say it's a process. The process can be slow. It can be fast. But it's a process. It's not going to happen instantly. It's going to be a process. Somebody say it's a process. All right. So God is showing Ezekiel, what I told you in th chapter 36 is going to happen, but it's a process. And in the process, there are three kinds of gatherings. The first gathering is what I call the gathering of dry bones. The gathering of dry bones. Gathering is our theme for this year. Gathering of dry bones. Ezekiel is in a valley and there are many dry bones the dry bones are all in one place so you can say they have gathered but they have all been defeated so you as you can liken it to the gathering of a defeated people the gathering of a conquered people the gathering of people who are together but each one of them is a dry bone each one of them has been conquered. Each one of them is dry. Each one of them is a symbol of defeat. You know, usually we say that in unity is strength. And there is a truth to that. It's not an absolute truth. Because there is a certain unity which is not strength. It's the unity of the defeated. It's the unity of the failed. If you add two failed people together, they will not be strong. If you add three failed people together, they will not be strong. If you add a thousand failed people together, they will be worse than an individual failed person. So if, for example, you have a nation that is poor and it joins to another poor nation, they'll be poorer. It's true. It, it multiplies the effect of the poverty. So this, every bone is dry. Every bone is defeated. And they are all together in one place. It gives me a picture of a continent of dry bones. Joined to dry bones. All in one family. When you are in a family of dry bones... You can love yourself, love each other. It won't go anywhere because everybody is a dry bone. So every bone is dry. That's the first kind of gathering. It's a gathering of defeated people. They are in one place. They're supposed to be in one place. It's supposed to be advantageous, but it is a disadvantage. You know, sometimes I, I wonder, you know, when we talk about our continent, Africa. Africa is a big deal for me. You know, EU, 
the Europeans came together, formed a union, they became stronger. The Asians came together, ASEAN, they formed a union, they became stronger. We, we do it, we first call it OAU, it didn't work. We said the O is a problem. So let's take away the O, AU, it didn't work. <laughs> now we can even call it U, it still won't work. Because it's a gathering of dry bones. We are together, but we are all weak. We are defeated. We have no strength. Everybody is defeated. Everybody is dry. Everybody is language, but we are all in the same place. That is not the unity that God is promising to give to Israel. It's not going to be bones in one place, failures in one place, defeated people in one place. It is not encouraging when everybody you know is like you. Broke. You are broke. Your best friend is broke. His best friend is broke. You form an association. It's an association of broke people. <laughs> You're going nowhere. It's, it's a nice gathering. But it's a gathering of dry bones. That's what God showed Ezekiel. He says, you are gathered, but you are sitting amongst dry people. And so far as it's a gathering of dry bones, there's no redemptive value in what God wants to do. The Bible says it's full of bones, very dry and very many. It's amazing how sometimes problem has the ability to gather in large numbers. In verse 37, verse 11 of chapter 37, God gives Ezekiel an insight into what the bones are. He says, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, the whole nation. You can replace Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina, Niger. Yes. The whole nation. They indeed say, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. And we ourselves are cut off. So in the valley of dry bones, there is a language. And if you are there, it will become part of your language. Our bones are dry. We are defeated. We are cut off. Nobody wants to help us. We are all alone. Because in the valley of dry bones, you become a companion of complainers. And that is exactly where Israel is at this time. And that's the situation that confronts Ezekiel. So how does God respond to these people? He says to Ezekiel in verses 7 and 8. So Ezekiel says, For, So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I, command, as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. The bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. And the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. There are two ideas I want to throw out to you. The first is the command of the Lord. Everybody say the command of the Lord. That's an instruction originating from God. And then the second is the prophesying of Ezekiel. Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded. God spoke and I repeated what he said. Ezekiel did not generate the prophecy. He only heard what God said and he said it. And that created the second kind of gathering. The gathering of inactive bodies. When Ezekiel prophesied, something happened. 
The bones came together. There is sinew, there is flesh, and there is skin. They are all in one place. But nothing is happening. Bones moving. Bones seeking. Bones joining. Still nothing happening. But it's better than the bones separated. Now something is happening. The bones join and they have proper ligaments. Something to hold them properly. Not like an ECOWAS protocol. That doesn't work. You know, I don't know about you. We've been here in West Africa. We will have one currency, the ECU. We will have it every year. It is coming next year. It is coming next year. It is coming next year. ECOWAS summit. ECOWAS protocol. ECOWAS parliament. Nothing happens. At least the bones have come together. There is some sinews. There is some muscle. There is some flesh. But it's still dead. It's very interesting how this happens. God commands. Ezekiel prophesied. And then the Bible says, there is a noise. God's command is silent. Nobody heard it. Ezekiel's prophecy is a single voice. But the moment Ezekiel declared the word, the Bible says there was noise. The Hebrew word is call. And it is not noise, meaningless noise. In many instances, it is translated as sound, as voice, as language. In other words, God spoke silently. Ezekiel spoke it and then a whole company of voices began to cry out the word of the Lord from the prophecy of Ezekiel from the command of the Lord. So in the valley, there is a noise. And then there is a rattling, a shaking. Another word for shaking is earthquake and in this process God commands Ezekiel prophesies and the noise is spread abroad it's one thing God commanding if nobody prophesies nothing happens if God commands and Ezekiel prophesies and nobody responds nothing happens but God commands Ezekiel prophesies and there are many others who begin to repeat the same word begin to repeat the same word. There is a noise abroad. And it is that that created movement for the bones. You know, sometimes you can be broke. You are a dry bone. But inside of you, you want life. You want to prosper. And you are in a community of other bones. Nobody wants to prosper like you. Then you hear of another dry bone who says, I want to make it. And you say, wherever that bone is, I'm going to join with him. I'm going to be partaker of him. Or you are defeated. Everything is down. Then somebody comes and says, I believe God will make a way. You say, I, I, I connect with you because my spirit now has a kindred spirit. Somebody who has heard what I've heard and somebody who can do what I want to do and I want to join with that person. In the joining of the bones, the bones didn't connect to the next bone lying by them. They connected to the bone that was suitable to them. So if you are a hand bone and you are lying by a skull, you don't go and connect a hand to a skull. If you are a femur and you are lying by a rib cage, you don't go and say, ah, there's a nice rib cage near, near me, let me go and connect. What you will create will be a monster. But every bone had to go to where its nearest connection was. What am I saying? Sometimes the connection you need to make may be far from you. 
The worst thing a person can say, for example, is I'll go to the church that is closest to me. You don't go to church for convenience. You go to church to connect. To connect. To connect. And if it means traveling a hundred miles, you have to go the hundred miles because you must find your bone. Listen to me. Many of us are living lives of convenience. We do what is easy for us. What is near to us. What we can do without sweat. But if you want to really break through in life, you're going to do the hard thing. You're going to move somewhere else. You're going to connect to something that is far. And if the bone you must connect to is on the other side of the valley, you have to go to the other side of the valley. And all of a sudden in the valley, bones were traveling. Traveling. They said, move away from my place. I have to go. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a patella. Knee bone. I have to go and connect to a proper thigh bone. Why are they connecting? Because they used to be together. And they were destroyed. And in the process of time, the wind has swept them. Erosion has swept them. Rainwater has moved them. And floods have moved them. And all of a sudden, although they used to be together, they are now far from each other. Each one has to go for the bone that is designated for it. Your best friend may not be the one you went to school with. Let me say this. The best neighbor for Ghana may not be Togo. I'm, I'm not against Togo. I love Togo. But I'm just saying the next neighbor may not be Togo. It may be Zimbabwe. That is why I have problem with regional groupings in the first place. Because you have to connect to a bone that is suitable to you. To build a viable body. It's like marriage. You don't marry somebody because you want to class one with them. You sat at the same desk. My, my, my side of the desk is here. My side of the desk is here. And she, we're saying the same. So I believe that God put us together. Who told you that? Sometimes you have to travel. You have to find a bone somewhere else. An unfamiliar bone. Somebody you've never known, but that is your connection. All I'm saying is, when God is bringing the bones together, proximity is not the essential factor. Strategy, strategic connection is the essential factor. God is about to connect you to somebody. The person may not be close to you now. The person may not be close to you now. But they are somewhere looking for you. And bone is going to meet with bone. God knows how to bring the right people your way. So that's the second gathering. Connection. Sinews. Ligaments. Flesh skin but there is nothing and God says I'm going to do the third one the third gathering is the gathering of breath the gathering of spirit he says you're going to command breath from the north the south the east and the west in other words there is something in in God's plan that is going to pull resources from every part of the world to coincide with where you are. He says you're going to prophesy to the breath. And he prophesied to the breath. The same way that God formed Adam on the ground. And there was no breath. And God breathed into him. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel's prophecy, breath came from God and entered into this body. 
And the Bible says they stood up and they became an exceedingly great army. An army that was conquered by Nebuchadnezzar has risen again. An army that was destroyed by Sennacherib, by the Assyrians, has now risen again. A restored army. A restored force. And they stood and became a great army. And God said to Ezekiel, this is what I was talking about in chapter 36. That I am going to take the bones which seem to be nothing. I'm going to join them together. I will put my breath into them. And they will become a mighty army. And if you read the book of Ezekiel. From that time, Ezekiel chapter 37. He didn't give any negative prophecy again. From Ezekiel chapter 37 to chapter 38, everything he saw was about restoration. Restoration of the law, restoration of the temple, restoration of priesthood, restoration of leadership, restoration until the last chapter. And the last word you read in the prophecy of Ezekiel, the last sentence is, the Lord is there. The Lord is there. And it started from chapter 36 with a new word. Chapter 37, a new vision. And from there, everything changed. Isn't it amazing that the army died by the sword, but God used a word to resurrect them. You would have thought God will use sword or physical implements to join them together. But they died physically by a sword. They resurrected by a prophetic word of the Lord. I came here tonight. I came here tonight with a mandate from God. To speak into your life. To speak into your destiny. To speak into your future. To speak into our nation. To speak into our continent. I came not with sword. I didn't come with spear. I didn't come from parliament. I didn't come from being a president. I came simply to announce God has spoken. I say it and this crowd will make the noise for it. That's all that is needed. We don't sit in parliament. We don't have constituencies that voted for us. We don't have motorcades in front of us. We don't have armies. We are not commanders in chief of a national army. But we are the children of the most high God. And what God says in secret, we announce publicly. That's why we can prophesy to Africa. Somebody will say, what power do you have? You are not a president. You don't have any power. What power did Ezekiel have? He is one voice, but when he voice he spoke, there was noise. Somebody say there will be noise. By my speaking, there will be noise. And there will be a movement. There will be a shaking. And that is why I have never stopped prophesying to Africa. And I will never stop. No matter what miserable government we live under, I will not stop because I am determined these bones must become an army. And if all that you see is the bones, but you never hear the word of the Lord, you would never, never see hope in the dry bones. But if you see the bones and you hear the word of the Lord, then you're going to declare and God is going to bring the bones together. Somebody say it's coming together. Say it's coming together for me. Say it's coming together for me. What was scattered is coming together for me. It's coming together for me. It's coming together for my family. It's coming together for my church. It's coming together for my tribe. It's coming together for my nation. It's coming together for my country. It's coming together for my continent. It's coming together for the world.
You know, when Israel went into captivity, they returned to their land. They had even lost their language. They were not speaking Hebrew again. They were speaking Aramaic. And after that, they were speaking Greek. And on and on, they lost their language. They were dispersed to every part of the world. The Hebrew language was gone for over 1,600 years. The Hebrew language was gone. And then from 19, early part of the 1900s, they started assembling and putting back their language. In world history, it is one of the most difficult things to do is to revive a dead language, like Latin, the almighty language of the Roman Empire. But this small tribe of people got their language back. Got their language back. Because God said it, that he'll give them their language, he'll give them their land. I don't know how long it's taking, but I also believe they used to say we were great people. They used to say we built pyramids. They used to say we taught mathematics to the rest of the world. But now we don't know mathematics. Our economies are ruined. But I believe the dry bones of Africa, the dry bones of the black man, the black woman, I believe the dry bones will come again. And history will be remade again. Pyramids will be built again. Libraries will be built again. Nations will rise again. Everybody say it with me. By the command of the Lord. We prophesy to the dry bones of Africa. Thus says the Lord, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews upon you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Say one more time. By the command of the Lord, we prophesy to the dry bones of our families. Thus says the Lord, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live then you shall know that i am the lord say by the command of the lord we prophesy to the dry bones in our lives thus says the lord surely i will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live i'll put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live then you shall know that i am the lord i am the lord that is the word of the lord to you this evening that says the lord i will put breath into you 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 I don't know what has happened to you. Maybe you become a dry bone. You've been kicked and kicked and kicked and kicked. Now you don't even know where you belong. But that says the Lord. The bones are coming together. There is a connection that will come to you. And people look at you and say that's the end of your story. But your story is about to begin. Your family story is about to begin. Your individual story is about to begin. Whatever valley you find yourself in. 
wherever you find yourself. No matter how dry your bone is. Some of you have not laughed in a long time. You've never been genuinely happy. You only smile. You don't laugh. You grin. You don't laugh. But God will put laughter in your heart and in your mouth. Some of us, you live hand to mouth, hand to mouth, hand to mouth, hand to mouth. But God is going to keep your hands so full that it cannot enter your mouth any longer. Because you are going beyond hand to mouth. Some of you, the enemy has put all kinds of problems on your life. Sickness upon your life. God says, he'll put breath into you. And tonight, as we conclude our 40 days of power, may the breath of God rest upon you. May the Lord connect you to the right people. May the Lord bring you divine connection. May the Lord do it for your family. May the Lord do it for your friends. May the Lord do it for your nation. Every African nation. Whether you are Ghana or Togo or Benin or Nigeria or Cote d'Ivoire or Guinea or Sierra Leone or wherever you are, Guinea-Bissau, wherever you are, Senegal, Gambia, Burkina Faso, Niger, we just had a coup. May God visit our continent. And the dry bones will become an army. I see the day when on this continent of Africa, we would see an army of captains of industry. Captains of industry. New inventors. Ideas coming up from here. We will not be trained in Africa and sell our intelligence to Germany and our intelligence to America and our intelligence to Canada. Canada is stealing our people. Stealing us. Stealing our doctors. Stealing our nurses. And we think it's a blessing. They are doing what Nebuchadnezzar did. What Sennacherib did when they looted the people. But that says the Lord. I will bring you back to your land. There's no continent in this world. No nation. Where people go to school. And don't work for their nation. It's a curse. You get trained in your country. And you give your strength to another. You may do it for a season. But you must come back. You must come back. Reinvest. Bring new technology. Bring new ideas. The Israelites, the Jews, they went everywhere. But they came back with wisdom. And science. And technology. And became one of the most industrialized nations in the world. Small group of people control so much of the world. Let it be our story. Let it be our story. God will put breath into you. Somebody say, I receive breath. I receive life from the mouth of God. Very soon we are going to partake of Holy Communion. And as we partake of co Communion, may a new breath enter into us. A new breath. Whatever has gone out of you, may God fill you to the overflow. Fill your joy. Fill your happiness. Fill your hand give you peace of mind give you strength and as we partake of this communion I just want you to be very mindful of what I just said God is rebuilding dry bones and our point of contact tonight 
is as we partake of this communion that the Lord will breathe afresh into us. That he will bring life to us. That he will restore what was broken. And before we partake of communion, if you are here this evening, and you say, yes, I want all of that, pastor. And I said, God wants to give you all of that. But the gateway to every blessing of God is to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. For you to be born again. For you to have salvation in Christ. For your sins to be forgiven. So for a moment, if you are here, everybody be seated just for a minute. If you are here and you want Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to be your Lord and your Savior. Just before we partake of communion, I want to pray with you that Christ will come into your heart, that the breath of God will enter you and make you a brand new person. If you are